Hello and welcome to the latest Lunch Club podcast. I'm Matthew Field and this month it's a great pleasure to be sitting in for Ollie Smith. Joining us this time is the BAFTA award-winning producer, Sally Hibben, who over the course of her 30-year career has made over 20 feature films here in the UK. Sally was responsible for nurturing and resuscitating Ken Loach's feature film career in the early 1990s with such films as Riff Raff and Lady Bird, Lady Bird. <laughs> Sally has also been active in film education at the National Film and Television School, as well as written a number of movie related books on subjects such as the Carry On films, Back to the Future and James Bond. Sally has also had a strong commitment to left-wing and socially progressive causes, which have influenced the films she has chosen to develop. Mm -hmm. Sally, thanks for joining us today. What a flattering uh, introduction. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sally, let's start off by talking about your, your mother, Nina Hibben, the film critic. Was she responsible for your love of cinema? I wouldn't have said that exactly. But ever since I was about five or six, I used to go to the flicks with her. Uh, on school holidays and so I'd, I'd be seeing five films a week so you know one day I, I would watch a classic Black Orpheus Brazilian rather raunchy film based on Orpheus and Eurydice and the next day I'd see The Young Ones and I met Cliff Richard so you know, but it was but it was also at the time of the French Nouvelle Vague and you know it was a period where you could really get into film. And the one that changed my views on film was Ke was Kez. And I met Ken because, uh, you know, they, they wine and dine the critics in those days. And I met Ken after Kez. But I thought Kez was just a perfect little film. Well, we'll, we'll come back to, to Ken Loach, if I may, in, uh, mm. a little bit later yeah. in the podcast. Um, but loving films is, is one thing, Sally, but producing them is, is something completely different. Can you tell me how you got into the business? Because you were an outsider. You didn't get in via nepotism. You got in on your, your own strength. How did your career in the film industry begin? Well, I started working with a group of lefties, doing documentaries and campaign ads, for the GLC, for CND, for uh, Voluntary Service Overseas, which actually led to one of the worst days in my filming life on CND. Why was that? We had, we had um, <clears throat> there was a big demo in Hyde Park and uh, we'd arranged for everyone to form a uh, human CND symbol. And we were gonna. We had a helicopter going over, over, and they told us it was the third one. So number one went, number two went. The third one was a bloody evening standard. <laughs> it all, <laughs> it all, everyone disappeared because they knew it was the third one. So. <laughs> well. You then went into into making drama. I mean, you start as you said, you started in these documentaries. Tell us how you got your first drama off the ground, because again, that's very different to documentary filmmaking. Well, we've done a bit of drama on the way, uh, and I learned a lot on the way. You know, because I had to do everything. I had to learn to drive, because I literally had to drive the minibus. You know, and I, I, I learned to cast. I learned to do the budget. I learned. To do it, I learned on my feet on all that stuff. But I was on holiday and I read this book called A Very British Coup, which is a political book about a Labour left wing prime minister um, who gets you know, destabilised by MI5 and CIA at Thatcher's time. That, that sounded like science fiction. <laughs> But, you know, that that um, set me off because I, I contacted Chris Mullen, who'd written the book. Uh, I knew how to do that because I can make contact in the left. <laughs> and he was uh, in the New States. He was the editor of the New Statesman. So I met up with Chris. And I discovered that somebody else had the rights. And so I then worked with Annie Skinner on it and, I had to persuade her to do a film of it. Eventually we did it as a three-part series for television. 
And I learned an awful lot from. Well, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, it stood you in good stead for the, the 20 films that, that followed. But what was interesting about this, Sally, is it won you a BAFTA, didn't it? Tell us about that. Yes, it won us a BAFTA and an Emmy, and the International Emmy. Um, not, not a bad start. No, not at all. I, I kept, when Ken phoned up and said, um, <clears throat> will, you, will you produce my next film? I thought, okay, so we get a BAFTA and then I read the script and I thought it was dreadful. Uh, I thought, okay, <laughs> win the BAFTA and then we'll just sink quietly into obscurity. No problem. <laughs> well, we've, before we talk about, about working with Ken Loach, just tell us about you know what it was like for an independent producer making films at that point. Riff Raff was 1991. Um, you know, it was a very tough time for independent filmmakers, Sally, and you seemed it, to it really was. embrace I mean, it. We relied on Channel 4, there's no question. You know, um, Channel 4, when I inherited Riff Raff, it was budgeted at $3 million. By the time we made it, I, I had it down to a million. With Ken's agreement, we'd done all sorts of things to it. The biggest thing we did would be combine the set and the production office so that the production offices are actually in the porter cabins that are part of the set. And it saved an enormous amount of money. And so one day, Channel 4 basically phoned up and said, we've got 750000 left. Can you make it for that? And we said, yes. <laughs> and we did. And the important thing is, not only did we make it for that, it got invited to the director's fortnight in Cannes. And um, Channel 4 sales refused to finance it. Because they said it won't sell. But we had enough money, amazingly, in the budget, left in my budget, to finance it going to Cannes. And it sold. And it sold crucially across Europe. And in those sales became the coalition that financed Ken's films until very recently, you know, the, the pre-sales in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Spain. Tell us then what Ken is like as a filmmaker to work with. I imagine he's quite challenging for a producer. Yes, I mean, you have to trust Ken. You know, you, you just do because... He's not very forthcoming with why he's doing something. He plays tricks. Um, uh, he was uh, my prop buyer. Called him the elf when I first met him, and he, which stands for the evil little fucker. <laughs> and that, that's because he plays tricks on people. In Raining Stones, for instance, when the loan sharks come in to um, the house and take her jewellery, she had no idea that was going to happen. And so it gets a very genuine reaction. And he will go... Uh, 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 riffraff. We hear Damon McCall's from Bobby, you know. It was a whole conspiracy that he couldn't see her. So he didn't know she was there in his flat at the end of the film. So there's a lot of trickery that goes on. But it's, I, I think it, it works because what he does is he gets that truthful first reaction, which allows him to then build on it. And what was your relationship like with him, Sally, producer to director? Well, cantankerous. I wondered for a long time what I had to do with the films. And then I saw Riff Raff again. And I realised that Riff Raff is, there's me all through Riff Raff. And I can't explain that, but there is. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, I do have an influence on the script. And I do have a creative part in this. Because the thing you have to understand is that there are two kinds of producer, or probably three. There's a creative producer who nurtures a script and, you know, becomes a mother to the director, as it were. 
And then there's the financial producer who raises the finance. And very few people do both. And I'm one of those that does both. Was that because you had to be, Sally, because of the type of films yeah. you're making? Yeah, absolutely. And also because I didn't know any better. You, you did five films with Ken, um, mm. finishing with Carla's song in 1999. Um, what, what, you know, what... Why did why did your collaboration come to an end? I think Ken's politics aren't my politics. There was a point in Carla's song where we'd forgotten to brief the army, uh, not the army, the rebels, whoever was coming in fighting. We'd forgotten to brief them, and it was so unlike Ken. And I think we'd start to take each other for granted. And that's not good in that kind of film, which demands a very, you know, a total kind of commitment to going where it is. But his politics aren't mine. His, you know, I think he's stuck in the 60s. You know, he doesn't really understand women's live. He doesn't understand race. One of our members, Deborah Blackman, wanted to ask you, Sally, would it be fair to say that, that Ken is more appreciated in Europe than he is here in the UK? Yes, at the time, I think it was. I mean, uh, Ladybird, Ladybird, which did nothing in Britain. I mean, we had Universal, for God's sake, distributed it. <laughs> it was off by Monday morning. <laughs> um, but in France, it kept showing on telly over and over again. And it was the first film I cut my crew in uh, for a percentage, which I've done ever since. And um, they must have all had two or three weeks more wages out of it because it was so successful. But I remember when I first went to Paris, you know, there's Ken Loach in every cinema. <laughs> you know, it was extraordinary. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the other directors that you've worked with because, you know, there's Ken, very prolific, but you've also worked with a lot of first-time directors, Sally. Um, was, that, was that conscious on your behalf to give new filmmakers a chance? Yes, I think so. Uh, first or second time. As you know, I've also worked with Stephen Frears, so it's not all first and second time. Um, uh, yes, I think so. I think because once I split from Ken, it, it was much more things that I was passionate about. And so I was looking for a director who could bring my passion to life. And that often meant finding somebody new or nearly new. <laughs> it's interesting when you when you look at producers, they're not necessarily stereotype for making a specific type of film um you know that comes more from the director but if you look at your body of work sally all these films there seems to be a theme running through them you know they feel mm. they, they film like a they feel like a you know a set um if it were um is that something that you've been conscious of that the fact that you know you've you've, you've tried to make films with the same themes of course i mean when channel four offered me to do dockers three-parter with Jimmy, which Jimmy McGovern wrote with the Sack Dockers in Liverpool, I jumped at the chance. You know, that was obviously right up my alley. And that was magic. We spent a year going to going out to Liverpool once a week uh, to a workshop where the, the Dockers would write scenes from the film. And when it came to it, I eventually sent Jimmy away and said, go write the script. He performed a miracle which is he included all the Dockers stuff, but it was somehow Jimmy's voice. And it was brilliant. Just brilliant. Can you just give us an insight, Sally, for our listeners, what, what Dockers was about? This was, a, this was a, um, a series you made in 1999. Yeah, the Liverpool Dockers were sacked by the company. And it was a sacked at Liverpool Dockers telling the story of the strike. Um. My favourite part of that was uh, we cast the scab predictably. It was going to be Ricky Tomlinson, who I'd grown very fond of on the two films we'd worked together with. <laughs> and uh, 
the director and I looked at each other and said, who's going to talk to Ricky then? And I drew the salt straw. <laughs> he did, and he, he, he played it beautifully, beautifully. Well, I want to ask you about your, your writing career, Sally, because not many people will, will know, but you also were the first author, official author, to write a book on the James Bond movies. In, in 1987, um, you were commissioned by Hamlin to write the official James Bond 007 movie book. How did that project come about? Because, you know, having looked at the type of films that you've made, 007 is, would hardly seem your thing. Well, I started off as a, as a journalist, in fact, uh, both as a film critic for Time Out and various other places. Oh, National Student. <laughs> and um, But I worked on a magazine called The Movie, which was, you know, one of these encyclopedias that builds in, in weekly parts, and which was an international film. So that, again, gave me a real grounding in international film. And the editor of it phoned me up and said, what do you think about James Bond? And I was just about to say not a lot when it occurred to me there might be a job on the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh, really interesting. There's a lot to say about Bond. And um, I went off and wrote this book in six weeks or something ridiculous. And, and I have to point out that um, your mother, Nina, actually called Dr. No Vicious Hokum. Well, I can understand she would. I mean, Doctor No isn't my favourite. You know, I think I, I think there are some. I love the spy who loved me. Uh, I I love the um, parachute jump that he does. You know, it's so tongue in cheek. And when when the Union Jack opens up, you know, I I think there. Are, <laughs> and one of the things I adore about the Bonds is that they do their stunts for real. You know, they're not. I spent a lot of time with the second unit with Arthur. Arthur Worcester. Arthur. Thank you. Uh, which is where I should have been because that's where it all happened, you know. And, uh, you, and for me, as a budding producer, it was fantastic because I got to ask questions of whoever I wanted. How did you do that? Why did you do that? And yeah, this was this I, was on the set of of License to Kill, wasn't it? The sixteenth James Bond film, yeah, made in Mexico. Indeed, indeed. And so that was fantastic, and it was a bit of a learning curve. Not that I've ever made a film of that level of budget, but, and this, you know it. And this was the book, The Making of License to Kill, wasn't it? The second book that you were commissioned, mm. or third book you were commissioned to write on the Bond movies. The fun thing, when when I, when I was on License to Kill. Because the the, the um, official history had become a bestseller. Uh, when people came up for autographs on the set, they wanted cubbies, Timothy Dawn's and mine. <laughs> okay. I, I'm I'm a Roger Moore fan. I mean, I, I, Roger Moore took the piss out of it, and I, I thought it was one. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did it very very well. We're just staying with, with writing, Sally. Um, one of our members, Dave Worrell, has asked, have you ever thought about writing an autobiography or a book about making films? I'm, I'm currently in the middle of writing my autobiography, <laughs> or I was before I threw myself downstairs a few weeks ago. Uh, and I will go back to it when I get the use of my right hand back, probably. <laughs> uh, which is also about making films, because I can't talk about you know, riffraff without talking about how we made it, how we financed it, <laughs> how you can do it at that lower budget. It's all part of my story. One, one film I want to ask you about, Sally, is Yasmin, um, which I thought was a very interesting film. And also, um, we should mention, it was written by Simon Beaufoy, who, of course, wrote Slumdog Millionaire and The Full Monty. Mm. Yes. The Daily Mail, Daily Mail, I should have framed, gave us the most brilliant review of, of Yasmin. It was, um, it was a film about Islamophobia and uh, a young girl, a Muslim girl who, you know, changes out of her uh, headdress into um, jeans and a T-shirt on the moors on her way to work and changes back before she goes home. And there's an underlying theme of her brother who becomes a suicide bomber. 
and which is something that I is very close to my heart because I've been to Palestine on several occasions. Partially, I took Yasmin there. In fact, the women adored it. The Islamicists hated it because she takes a hijab, and it became really controversial. And the Islamicists stopped, tried to stop it showing in Bethlehem University. But I don't know if you understand, but the West Bank is very small. And I was in a coffee shop where the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of Bethlehem University happened to be. (laughs) I told him what had happened. He said, no, that's ridiculous. We'll show it. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't get to the screening. But the debate raged for hours afterwards. Really? Because it, it was very close to their heart. And it was really nice for me because it was my previous trips to Palestine that partially inspired Yasmin. And uh, I thought it was great that he got that reaction. We've got to remember this film was made 20 years ago, Sally. So, uh, you know, the, the landscape for making films was very different back then. How hard was it to get a film with a subject matter like that made in the late 90s? Well, we were lucky in that Kenny Glenn Arn had previously worked with the uh, documentary department of Channel 4. And in fact, we did it with the documentary part department uh, on the grounds that sometimes you have to <laughs> dramatise to tell the truth. Um, and so that, uh, so that made it easier. I think we did it with that and whatever arts council or BFI or whatever the subsidy was out there at that moment, and tax credit. Sally, just looking at your filmography, one of the ones that, that, that stands out here amongst them is The Englishman Who Went Up a Hill But Came Down a Mountain, the film that starred Hugh Grant. Can you tell us the story behind that, how that movie came to be? Yes, well, it was Sarah that developed it with Chris Munger. Chris wrote it. And I loved it. I mean, I thought it was a great little film. And um, <laughs> we went off to um, Cannes and found some German financiers. Um, and then Harvey decided he wanted it. And he um, wooed us for a week. Uh, and we were get, getting bottles of wine and flowers. And this is every time the meeting changed. Anyway, eventually we met a Heathrow on his way out. And, um, you know, we talked about it. And he said, you know, he thought it was really cute, this little Welsh village nestling in the hills. And we said, no, wrong. This is a Welsh film. It's the English who are cute. (coughs) And then Sarah and I had rehearsed this, so I took a deep breath and said, you know, I I hear you're pretty dreadful to work with. And he was about to splutter and explode. And then he said, no, you asked John Sells, you asked Spitely. And then he took a deep breath and said, I well, hear you make great films, but never make any money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just on the subject of, of Harvey Weinstein, did you get to know him at all, Sally, during the process of, of that project? Do you mean, did I know that what was going on? Yeah. Well, I mean, however you wanted to interpret the question. Yes, I think we all knew what was going on. Um, Donna Gelotti, who was uh, his um, (laughs) assistant in London, used to protect the girls as much as she could, would make sure that they only ever went to his room in pairs. You know, I mean, yeah, we knew what was going on. Why none of us talked about it then? I mean, we did talk about it. Obviously, I wouldn't know that. But why none of us thought we could do anything about it, then it's beyond me. I suppose it's times have changed. Uh, can I ask you, Sally, why did you stop making films? Was that a conscious decision <laughs> you had enough? I mean, what was, the, what was your thoughts behind that? I think I had stopped making films until I... So I did to do ID2. And I met a really great director, Joel Novoa, 
who I think is one of the, is probably the best director I've worked with. And I, I think if he had a film, I would produce it. In, in a sense, I wouldn't want to raise the money anymore. I'm too much out of the loop. <laughs> but I would happily go and, you know, be his mother, you know, the, the person who sorts everything out for him. <laughs> <laughs> That I'm sure you're 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 very good at, Sally. Um, I mean, yeah, he 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 wrote me the most beautiful email after um, ID two, just saying how he felt he, I'd always got his back and how brilliant it had been, you know. ID two came out, I believe, in 2016. Um, what was that final film of yours about, Sally? Again, it was about Islam, about an Islamic cop. Well, you understand that ID1, of course, is a cult classic, the first of the football hooligan films, and probably the only one that's politically correct. I think I'm right in saying that. <laughs> it's about, ID1 was about four coppers who go undercover into hooligan gangs and become hooligans, thus proving that all police are hooligans, um, which we knew. ID2 comes from a different place. It comes from um, Islamic copper going undercover <coughs> into the gangs in modern day Hull. So Nick Haig has asked us, Sally, which of your films do you find was the most enjoyable to work on? So I've got so many stories about a Carlos song. You know, <laughs> things like, you know, I get to set one morning and there's a sound of gunfire and there's a pink coral snake on Bobby's dressing table. <laughs> and my my um, driver, who's a major, has shot it. <laughs> <laughs> that, was know, Rob, that, was, that was Robert Carlyle you're talking about. Yeah. Or, you know, there was another time when we were, uh, doing an ambush in the woods and I saw one of the another soldier army guy we, we worked very closely with the army on the film they were our major supporters really I saw him in tears and he said I'm sorry it just brings it all back mm. and I think the Nicaraguans are very gentle people who you know didn't deserve what happened there and um, I just really enjoyed working on it. You, you mentioned earlier on, Sally, that your politics are, are not necessarily in line with those of, of Ken Loach. Um, what do you think of his more recent films? I mean, he's had great success recently with films like I, Daniel Blake. Um, have you followed them? Have you watched them? I, I, I watched one in three, really. Um. Yes, I liked our Daniel Blake, but it's still... I mean, the, the joy of Ken is the respect he has for the working class. You know, and, he, and, and the reality of that situation. But he doesn't... You know, he's anti-Europe. Well, I'm passionately pro-Europe. Uh, and uh, I know that's silly and it's a small thing, but it becomes a big thing. Especially, I guess, when you're telling stories. Yes. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any feminism in him at all. And he, I found Kiss, I think, was, was not nearly as good as he has been in trying to tell the same kind of story. As a female producer, Sally, what's your view on equal opportunities for women in UK film and television right now? I mean, it's a subject which is, you know, being discussed at length in the trades. Well, I don't really have a view on it right now because I'm out of it. So I don't exactly know what's going on. I mean, I think the problem is that there aren't enough women directors and women, or women writers because women tell a different story you know it's Literally. like black people tell a different story um 
working class tell a different story. And so we're, we're not getting the range of stories that we could be getting. And I think that's frustrating. <laughs> It's really interesting, Sally, you've had these different careers, this writing career and then this producing career. Um, and have the, have the two ever crossed over? Have you ever been, I don't know, promoting a film or something and someone's come up to you and said, oh, you know, are you, are you Sally Hibben that wrote the Bond books? I've got two examples of that, actually. I was going around the country in my little mini uh, doing local radio shows for promoting the Bond books. And somebody said, are you the same Sally Hibbin that did British Goo, <laughs> a very British Goo? And I went, oh, congratulations, you're the first person to put it together. And the second one was even better. We were in Berlin uh, with Ladybird, Ladybird, and we'd had the press screening that morning. And I was, I, for some reason, hadn't brought tights with me. And I was sitting outside the hotel shop, which was shut, and a guy came up to me and said, hello, you're Sally Hibbin, aren't you? I went, yeah. And um, he said, oh, I'm the president of the James Bond fan club in Berlin. Let me tell you all the mistakes you made in your film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's that not many in there, Sally, I'm sure. Oh, I don't know, he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just in closing, Sally, you know, looking back on, on your career, are you proud of your body work? Are you proud of these films that you've made? I mean, I imagine there's a you've got a draw there of scripts that you've never produced, but the ones that you've got to the screen, are you proud of? Yes. I mean, it's very interesting when I meet people and I say I'm a film producer um, and they say, what have you produced? Almost everyone will fit into one of three categories. They'll either know Ken Loach, or they'll know ID, or they'll know the Englishman who went up a hill but came down a mountain. And so I can define myself by that somehow. And yes, I am very proud of it. Well, Sally, we're really looking forward to your autobiography and we hope that you'll come along to the lunch club uh, for a signing uh, when the book's published. And thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs>